Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. This is the second episode in this series, Bridging the Gap, and it's part two as well of the conversations I had with staff and students at the Oaks Specialist College. From last week's episode, it was clear how successful the Oaks was in connecting with employers to make that gap between school and the next steps a bit narrower to navigate. Maybe they wouldn't say it was that easy, but I think it showed that it was really a case of if you don't ask, you don't get. But first, a quick word from the show's sponsor. Red Giraffe Solutions is a project dedicated to helping parents answer the question, what happens to my child when I'm no longer around? They do this by providing resources and training in four areas, daily living, purpose, relationships, and finance. Their newest resource is an online course on building independent skills. You can visit redgiraffesolutions.com to find out more. And if you want to get an early Christmas present from the Red Giraffe, Listen for a very special offer only being given to podcast listeners at the end of this episode. So continuing the conversations about how the Oaks operates, my first guest on this episode is Joshua Epstein, who is the careers leader at the Oaks. Josh's role is really twofold, working with both the young people and the employers. And when I think of job coach now, I tend to think that they are coaching the organisations as much as they are there to coach the young person that they're supporting. I started by asking Josh what his role involves and how they go about connecting young people with employers. We have two qualified job coaches, me being one of them. Um, So we kind of support all of our learners into work experience and employment, wherever that be. We reach out to employers, um, depends on which learner it is, um, because we have our three different ability groups. So our PFA, PFA three, so I'm mainly going to be going out to work. We want them to be applying for jobs and then to be reaching out for themselves. So there's no point us finding them jobs because then once they've, once they've left, they'll be still in that situation of, oh, I don't know uh, how to apply for jobs. I haven't been through that process. So with our PFA3 learners, we want them to kind of be reaching out to employers themselves, applying for jobs themselves. But with our PFA2s and our PFA1s, we have our, both our job coaches here that kind of reach out to employers for different work experience, whether it's community projects, whether it's kind of our internal work experiences as well with our Tesco. So it's kind of just reaching out to employers saying that look, we're here to support as well, give our guys an opportunity, give them a chance and see what kind of what they can do. If there's anything they can't do, we can make reasonable adjustments, we can be here to support, we can give you disability awareness training. So I'm kind of aware of that middle person to make sure everything kind of runs smoothly and like I said, we have the, we're trying to reach out to as many employers as possible and I think this year it's obviously been a bit of a tricky year with COVID and everything, but now that businesses and shops are starting to open back up again, we're really busy. We're trying to get everyone out. Like, don't get me wrong, it's, it's good to do our internal work experiences, but external work experiences is like a foot in the door to gain employment. And it's kind of like a working interview. So an opportunity for them to just to kind of showcase what they can, whether it's in two weeks or whether it's one day a week or just for a couple of hours. It's just an opportunity just to ease them into the workplace, kind of show them what skills and everything they can they can bring a business and the benefits they can as well. So when they go into an employer, they have someone with them supporting them? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have the job coach be with them to support them to start off with. But we don't really want a member of staff hanging around in the background of the shop. So we kind of, as soon as it's possible, kind of fade that support away. And then like, they'll normally have a buddy as well with an employer. So they'll get buddied up with another member of staff or if it's a small shop, they'll be buddied up with a manager. But it's just to kind of ease them in. So whether it, we, like some learners, we might start off on one hour, one day a week, but whereas others, they can go straight in and do a full six hour day while they're at college. So some of our learners will go straight to their work experiences from home or some of them come into college and then they'll go from there, from college to their work experiences. What's some of the biggest challenges? Because one of the things that, uh, that I've... <coughs> found from talking to mm. lots of people is this whole idea of reasonable adjustment mm-hmm. and that employers think oh, what is that how difficult is that going to be it's going to be massive it's going to cost a lot of money is that one of the issues that you see yeah i think it's just an issue that employers think all oh, right it's going to be it's going to be a huge job to take someone on it's got additional needs but actually that's not that's not quite the case it's more a case of all oh, right they might take a little bit longer to understand and comprehend what you've asked them to do but as long as there is, there's plenty of other ways of doing things. Instead of saying, no, you can't do that, it's no, let's try another way. Let's make a reasonable adjustment. Let's break. Let's do a job analysis. So our job coaches will break down the job into more manageable, manageable steps um, for the employer. So you'd work with the employer and they might say, oh, uh, so-and-so is struggling with this. So the job coach will come in and say, actually, look, there's a different way of doing it. We can break down the job into more manageable steps. It's still the way that you want it to be done, but it's just working it out a different way for, for the learner who's going in there. 
would imagine sometimes that's an asset to the company then as well because they've learned another way of doing it. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. So it's more obviously there's plenty of other ways of doing doing different jobs, and it's just like saying all of our learners here are different and they learn different ways. But it's, there's no reason why they can't do that job just as well as anyone else would. And I think it's just kind of taking that chance and giving them a yeah giving them an opportunity to prove themselves and say look they can they can bring so many uh, other positives to the business. Josh makes a number of good points there, particularly around making the young person do as much as they are able to do for themselves when it comes to searching for a job because then they're better placed to develop those transferable skills after that support fades away. From personal experience with my own daughter and her work experience, it hasn't always built her skills because it was so closely monitored, there weren't that many opportunities for her to get challenged or to make mistakes, which is how we learn new things. I certainly don't mean that we don't provide support for our young people when they do work experience, but if everyone is being closely monitored, then they're clearly not going to be able to challenge themselves as much. And Josh also talked about the value of external work experience. And I think there are two reasons why this is important. And Josh alluded to those really. It's obviously useful to give a young person valuable experience, but he also gives an employer experience of someone working for them that has additional needs and may even require, and this should come with a warning sound, reasonable adjustments. Because once more employers realise in fact that it is reasonable, not unreasonable, then maybe more work experience opportunities will open up and become available for our young people. Next up, I spoke to a number of the young people at the Oaks. Apologies for some sound issues here. It was a group recording, so there's always some challenges. But what I'd like you to take from this is the ordinariness of it all. Every single young person here is talking about work like you would expect any young person to talk about work. Some love their jobs. Some are just doing it for, to learn new skills. Some have had some challenges, but it's all very ordinary in terms of what they were doing. I did ask everyone the same question, which was to talk about the job roles that they'd had whether that be work experience or paid work. So first up, it was Brian. I started working at Oakley School in Tompkins Wells, was doing caretaking there for two weeks. And then after that, I'd done a bit of mechanics with my dad because he's a mechanic. And then after I did mechanics with my dad, I worked at Waitrose in Tompkins High Street. I was there from February to July and um, I enjoyed it quite really well. And now I'm currently at Infosport. I've been there since February last year for a little bit, then obviously because the pandemic hit. And then I've been there, back there in September. I'm like doing the till, because I'm the shop floor basically. But yeah, I'm enjoying it really well. They like you, don't they? Yeah, they do, because um, I'm always there on time. I'm, I'm well, really early basically. And I'm quite good with customers and um, it's quite enjoyable really. Could you see yourself doing something like that as long term or is it just to get a little bit of experience? Just to get a little bit of experience to be honest and um, but yeah everyone's really good there. Yeah I'm, I managed to try and do things without being asked to do stuff so that'd be taking the bins out, doing the general bloody cleaning in the place so. Hmm. What sort of skills you, have you developed while you're there sort of so when you're speaking to customers what is that? That's um, greeting them basically so when customers walk into the shops I'll say good morning how they, has their day been if they need help with anything but if I'm not sure about something I'll speak to my colleague about it and then they'll explain it properly to the customer then I'll sort of get it in my head that they know what I'm what, what they're on about basically so do you have someone supporting you like that like you said a colleague does someone support you when you yeah sometimes if I'm on the till and it's a code comes up onto the product they, go, oh, they, click, they say click onto that, so I click onto that, and then I'll type in, type in the code of what it is on the, the till, and it will show up. I think Brian articulates exactly why our young people make great employees. Going the extra mile, as the saying goes, and the enthusiasm to learn new things. Next up, I spoke to Sky. I work at the Premier Inn, where I do like housekeeping, like cleaning the room, doing, like, if they needed me to do, like, hoovering, I would do that. Um, How long did you work for them? Sky actually still works there now, because obviously you got work experience in a nursery, didn't you? And that's, that's yeah. been your sort of career, you've got a part-time job at the Premier Inn, but we're looking yeah. to gain 
the school is actually where we should have before, what, what nurseries? Bright Stars Nursery. What was you learning there? What were you doing? I was helping like the children and reading to them. They have a green pet sky, I can go back there and finish it off because because of the effects of COVID they had to stop yeah. her work placement, but they had mm. really said she did such an amazing job, we'd happily have her back. And you'll keep your job at the Premier Inn as well. Yeah. I'll admit I was very impressed with Sky's work ethic, keeping her part-time role while still doing work experience, which would help her towards her final career of choice. Of course, for many young people, this is an economic necessity, and that is one of the challenges around work experience, the fact that it's mostly unpaid. Next up was Charlie. Well, I started at the first work experience at the Hilton Hotel. Then COVID hit, so I stopped that. And then it was into sport. And then I'm at m and working at m and Paid employment as well. So what do you do in your paid job then? What kind of things I do you do? I do the trolleys, the baskets, do all sorts of things. You deal with the customers as well? Yeah, I help customers out as well. Charlie's, from what I saw, quite a reserved person. But obviously that didn't have any impact on his potential to get paid work. And I'm sure that the impact that he had on the organisation is much more than he realises, especially as an example to other young people. Next up, I spoke to a bit. My first um, work experience was um, five or six years ago with Oakley School. I used to help admin team, like um, filing invoices, using spreadsheet, helping them to put data on the computer system. I sometimes helped in the front desk, signing in visitors. Yeah, it was really good. I've gained a lot of experience at talking to visitors, gave me, boosted a bit of my confidence. After that, after I, I left sixth form and I went to West Kent College and I'd done IT for two years, I basically, one of my modules was I had to do work experience. So I went to Sainsbury's in Tonbridge and basically um, I'd done my work experience, which was really good. And um, then obviously I had a paid employment, which was the year after that. I worked in Sainsbury's Mount Pleasant. So my main duties were down there, like um, serving customers, putting stock and helping the supervisors, sometimes doing um, stock rotation. So I really gained experience and dealing with the high pressure as well on a Saturday night when, you know, a lot of young people go a lot of drinking and, you know, clubbing and they come at night time to buy alcohol and they, they can be quite amusing sometimes, like... It's a very nice way of putting it. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, to deal with those um, banter sometimes, so... So yeah, it was really good. Um, obviously I left my um, course, got quite a lot hard and basically I had to quit because it was too much pressure. You have to admire how Abid describes the people he dealt with in his role at the supermarket. And I suspect that's probably why I'm sure this employer was very sorry to see him leave. But he made what was clearly the right decision for him so that his coursework took priority. Of course, this is an issue for many young people, finding the time for everything but sometimes it's better to make a decision that will have longer term benefits. And finally, I spoke to Molly. I work with, um, with horses. Um, me and my friend Tiffany work with Tiffany's mum and aunt. Um, it's a equine therapy centre, but non-riding. So we work with a lot of kids, adults, young adults with learning difficulties, anxiety, depression, terminal illnesses. So we do a lot of therapeutic stuff with the horses, so lots of grooming, which is a natural way of saying to the horse, I want to be your friend. Then we do lots of horsemanship stuff like leading, and if they've not wanted to do anything horsey related, we do artsy, crafty stuff, thoughts and feelings with chalk, drawing on the floor. We've painted the horses, but we use non-toxic paint. The horses love it, the kids love it, so it's all a very mutual thing. I first went there when I was sort of 15, 16, for a two weeks work experience, and I absolutely loved it, because at the time I didn't know what I wanted to do for work experience, so um, my mum recommended me 
going there. And while I was doing that, I thought, actually, I love this. I want to keep doing this. So I did a level one horse basic stable management and horse care course, which taught me all sorts of different things. And then I progressed with the level two course, which is more in depth, like first aid, different feeds, problems of saddles that aren't fitted properly. So I've been learning all of that. Hopefully soon I'll be doing my level four course because that's on positive training and then we'll be doing the level three. And because I've done all my courses, I, um, I'm like a facilitator, so almost like a mentor to the students. So if we get students doing level one or level two courses, I help them out with that. I help out with all the clients that come for their therapeutic sessions. So I'm like an extra pair of hands. If anyone needs any help, I can help them as well. And I just use my experience to help others and it's been great. So you, is that where you're planning to work when you finish here? Yes, hopefully. Um, at the moment, because next year they were thinking of doing something like a a paid placement, but instead of the money going to me, the money's going to be going towards my next course that I'm going to be learning. So my work will be going towards that course. So uh, I'm really excited. I love listening to Molly's passion for her career of choice, and one that seems like it was a little bit accidental. Often that's the thing. We don't know what we like until we actually do it. It really is only a small number of people who know exactly what they want to do when it comes to their future career. So it's important to remind our young people that just getting some experience will help them think about what they might want to do in the future. Thanks for listening. There will be a short break for a few weeks. So the podcast will be back in 2022 with the 100th episode, as well as continuing this series, Bridging the Gap, with more examples of how to ensure our children avoid that cliff edge scenario. Before I finish up, more about that special offer from the show sponsor, Red Giraffe Solutions. Red Giraffe Solutions is a project dedicated to helping parents answer the question, what happens to my child when I'm no longer around? Their newest resource is an online course on building independent skills. Normally priced at $99, until the 31st of December, there is an exclusive offer for Expanding Worlds podcast listeners who will get the course for half price if they use the code EW12. So if you'd like to take advantage of this 50% discount, visit redgiraffesolutions.com, click on courses on the top menu, which will take you straight to where you can register for the course, put in the code EW12, and you can take advantage of this exclusive offer. Have a great holiday break, however you spend it. Thanks again for listening. It means a lot to me and all my guests having the chance to share stories and share solutions, which I know from my own experience can make all the difference to the future of our children. As always, if you could leave a podcast review, that would be great. If you have any feedback or recommendations for guests, please get in touch. You can email me at podcast at expandingworlds.com and see you in 2022.